Welcome to the second part of the Pelvic Organ Prolapse video course. Let's work through a case. Imagine that you're a family physician or a gynecologist working in a busy clinic. You have a very pleasant G5 P5 76 year old lady, Mrs. Watson, who presents to your office with a sense of pelvic pressure or heaviness. She says that it has been going on for more than five years and has become progressively worse. She now feels like there is something protruding from her vagina, especially when she stands up or lifts objects. She also has difficulty voiding and needs to manually reduce this bulge in order to empty her bladder fully. A case like this is common. Patients with prolapse often suffer in silence for an average of five to seven years before seeking care. Let's start by talking about risk factors for pelvic organ prolapse. Can you name at least five risk factors? Prolapse is more common in Caucasian and Hispanic women. Caucasian and Hispanic women tend to have a wider gynecoid pelvis. African American women tend to have a narrow pelvis. They have a smaller pelvic floor area which protects against prolapse. Prolapse develops gradually over the years and the incidence of prolapse doubles every decade of life. Menopause results in hypoestrogenism. Estrogen receptors are found in the connective tissue, levator ni muscles, and uterosacral ligaments. Estrogen is needed for pelvic organ support. Lack of estrogen results in urogenital atrophy and decreased pelvic organ support. Pregnancy, vaginal delivery, pelvic floor trauma from forceps delivery, or anal sphincter laceration are also implicated in prolapse. According to Williams Gynecology, the risk of prolapse increases by 1.2 times with each vaginal delivery. Chronically increased intra-abdominal pressure from chronic cough, COPD, increased BMI, constipation, and repetitive heavy lifting is also a risk factor. Connective tissue changes are important in pathogenesis of prolapse. Having a family history of prolapse may be secondary to changes in type 2 collagen. Inhaled chemicals found in tobacco may also cause connective tissue changes. Having connective tissue disorders So which risk factors does Mrs. Watson have? She's Caucasian, elderly, postmenopausal, and has had five pregnancies and five vaginal deliveries. She had one assisted delivery with forceps and a third degree laceration. She's a smoker and has a 15 pack year smoking history. She denies having any chronic cough COPD, constipation, or repetitive lifting. She does have an increased BMI of 29 and reveals that her mother and sister had uterine prolapse. Aside from the risk factors, what else would you like to ask this patient on history? You can group the symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse into five categories. Bulge symptoms, urinary symptoms, bowel symptoms, sexual dysfunction, and other symptoms. For bulge symptoms, the patient may report feeling pelvic or vaginal pressure or feeling a vaginal bulge. They may feel like they're sitting on a ball or there's a bulge rubbing against their clothes. Bulge symptoms tend to worsen during the day and with physical activity. A patient with urinary symptoms may present with stress incontinence, which is involuntary leakage of urine with increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. They may leak urine with sneezing, coughing, laughing, or exercise. 
Ask your patient if they use pads for protection and how often they change a pad. Patients may use pads for incontinence, discharge from prolapse, or staining. They may also have symptoms of overactive bladder. Overactive bladder consists of urgency, with or without frequency, nocturia, and urge incontinence. The main symptom of overactive bladder is urgency. A patient with frequency has to urinate often. They may also have nocturia, where they have to wake up at night to urinate. A patient with urgency will have a sudden need to run to the bathroom. If there is no bathroom close by, or they are not fast enough to make it on time, they may leak urine. If you are looking for a bathroom, patients with overactive bladder are the best people to ask, since they know where the bathrooms are. There are also bathroom mapping apps available for patients to use. Patients may complain of incomplete emptying of the bladder and may manually reduce the prolapse to begin or complete voiding. They may also change positions during voiding to better empty their bladder. Incomplete emptying can be caused by various neurological disorders in the elderly, lumbosacral disc disease, spinal stenosis, and poorly controlled diabetes. Incomplete emptying of the bladder may lead to urinary retention and recurrent UTIs. Don't forget to ask the patient about symptoms of UTI, whether they have had positive documented cultures, have been treated with antibiotics for a UTI, and whether their symptoms have improved with antibiotics. Approximately 70% of patients with prolapse have bowel complaints. Although patients may report feeling constipated, it is important to know that constipation is not caused by the prolapse. Straining from constipation often contributes to the development of prolapse. It is viewed as a separate functional problem and treated separately. Patients with endocel or rectocel may complain of incomplete bowel emptying. They may use digitation to evacuate the stool vaginally and or rectally or perform perineal splinting. Also, surgically correcting a rectocel will help with bowel evacuation, it will not fix the constipation. It is important to talk to the patient about what will and will not improve with treatment. Patients may also experience incontinence of lattice or stool. This is not a usual symptom of prolapse. It is usually due to a structural or neurological problem with the internal or external anal sphincter. Patients may also have sexual dysfunction. The most common complaints are vaginal laxity with intercourse and decreased sensation. Other symptoms may include dyspareunia, decreased libido, and inability to achieve an orgasm. Sexual dysfunction is multifactorial and may be due to menopause and other psychosocial factors. These include erectile dysfunction of the partner, issues around retirement, couple intimacy, as well as others. This is important to consider when counseling patients about realistic expectations of their treatment. Other symptoms may include pelvic pain and back pain. These are uncommon and may result from musculoskeletal problems, scarring from previous deliveries, and atrophy from menopause. Patients often have trigger points on exam or hypertonicity of some of their pelvic floor. These symptoms can be addressed with physiotherapy or a pessary. Surgery will not necessarily help. So which symptoms does Mrs. Watson have? Let's make a list of her problems. 1. Bulge symptoms. She has a vaginal bulge with standing up and lifting objects. 2. Incomplete emptying. She has had one episode of urinary tension requiring catheterization. 3. Dysuria. Could her dysuria be caused by a urinary tract infection or urogenital atrophy? Mrs. Watson says that her main concerns are the bulge symptoms and urinary symptoms. 
She feels like there's something protruding from her vagina every time she stands up or lifts objects. When you ask about urinary symptoms, she denies having any stress incontinence or symptoms of overactive bladder. She is unable to empty her bladder fully without shifting positions or manually reducing the bulge. She has had one previous episode of urinary retention which required catheterization. It is important to ask what precipitated her urinary retention. Common triggers include a urinary tract infection, constipation, narcotics, surgery, or a fall. Mrs. Watson states that she was told by an emergency physician that she had a urinary tract infection at that time and took a full course of antibiotics. In terms of symptoms of UTI, she reports having some dysuria but denies any hematuria, urgency, frequency, lower abdominal pain, back pain, fevers, or chills. Her bowel movements are regular. She denies any incomplete emptying or incontinence of flatus or stool. She's sexually active but has been avoiding intercourse in the last six months. She states that the feeling of prolapse makes intercourse difficult. She would like to continue being sexually active in the future. She denies any pelvic pain or back pain. Next, you need to ask about gynecological history, obstetrical history, past medical history, family history, and social history. Mrs. Watson is a G5, T5, P0, A0, L5 female and has had five vaginal deliveries. She has had one assisted delivery with forceps and a third degree laceration. Her last menstrual period was 30 years ago. She denies any postmenopausal bleeding. Her paps have been regular. Her last pap was at the age of 70 and she has never had any abnormal paps. She is sexually active and in a monogamous relationship with a male partner, she denies any previous history of gynecological problems or pelvic surgeries. Mrs. Watson is fairly healthy for her age. In terms of her past medical history, she has a history of hypothyroidism, osteoarthritis, appendicitis in 1963, and cholelithiasis in 1970. She is taking levothyroxine 0.075 mg daily for hypothyroidism and acetaminophen 650 mg daily for osteoarthritis. She is allergic to pollen but denies any allergies to medications. Her past surgical history includes appendectomy in 1963 and cholecystectomy in 1970. Her family history includes uterine prolapse in her mother and sister, hypertension in her brother and father, and breast cancer in her sister. In terms of her social history, Mrs. Watson has a 15-pack year smoking history and smokes half a pack per day for the past 30 years. She takes one alcoholic drink per week and denies any recreational drug use. Do not forget to ask about the patient's living situation. Partner's medical status and family support can greatly influence patient's decision about the treatment plan. Mrs. Watson states that she has a good home support. Now that we have the history, let's do a physical examination. So what would you like to do on physical exam? Always begin with an inspection. Observe as Mrs. Watson walks into the room. Does she appear to be obese? How's her mobility? Mrs. Watson does appear to be overweight, but has good mobility. Let's do an abdominal examination. Assess for abdominal scars, presence of abdominal pain, abdominal masses, fibroids, and ascites. You're looking for anything in the abdomen that could be pushing on the pelvic floor. Let's inspect the perineum for atrophic vaginitis. Mrs. Watson does have some urogenital atrophy. Next, let's do a valsalva. 
ask Mrs. Watson to cough or bear down and observe for stress incontinence. You can also assess for latent stress incontinence by reducing the bulge with a cotton swab and asking Mrs. Watson to cough. Also check for urethral hypermobility. Observe for movement of a urethra with Valsalva. Some gynecologists prefer to do a Q-tip test to measure urethral hypermobility. This is rarely done in clinical practice, but used in research. Urethral hypermobility is a movement of a urethra by more than 30 degrees. It indicates poor urethral support. Mrs. Watson has some urethral hypermobility, but does not appear to have any stress incontinence. Next, ask the patient to bear down and inspect for prolapse. You can also assess the patient standing with one leg up on a stool to better reproduce her symptoms. We will continue with the speculum examination. Place the speculum into the vagina and ask the patient to strain. Slowly withdraw the speculum, looking for uterine prolapse. Then split the speculum and displace the posterior vaginal wall to visualize the anterior vaginal wall. Ask the patient to strain and observe for cystocele. Now, rotate the speculum 180 degrees and displace the anterior vaginal wall to visualize the posterior vaginal wall through rectocele and enterocele. Rectoceles and enterocele are usually distinguished during surgery, but you might be able to see some peristalsis on physical examination if an enterocele is present. You can grade the prolapse using the Baden-Walker halfway system. It is an older system designed in 1968. It measures the most distal portion of prolapse relative to the hymen. Grade 0 is assigned when pelvic organs have a normal position. Grade 1 is when the descent is halfway to the hymen. Grade 2 is when the descent is to the hymen. Grade 3 is when the descent is halfway past the hymen. And grade 4 is the maximal possible descent. Another way to grade the prolapse is POP-Q, which is the Pelvic Organ Prolapse Quantification System. It is newer, more precise, and reproducible than the Baden-Walker Halfway System. Some gynecologists use POP-Q, while others use the Baden-Walker Halfway System. On your examination, Mrs. Watson appears to have a grade 3 cystocele. This means that her bladder is descended halfway past the hymen. She does not appear to have any uterine prolapse, rectocele, or enterocele. Now let's assess for pelvic muscle strength. Place two fingers into the patient's vagina at 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock and ask her to do a Kegel contraction. Assess for the strength of pelvic muscles and any asymmetry. You can use the Oxford gradient system for pelvic muscle strength. It applies a 6-point scale to rate pelvic muscle strength. Asymmetry may be present in patients who have had prior forceps delivery, episiotomy, or laceration. Mrs. Watson does appear to have poor pelvic muscle strength. It is also important to palpate the pelvic floor for any trigger points. Look for points of tenderness and any scar tissue. Let's proceed with a bimanual examination looking for any other pelvic pathology, such as pelvic masses or an enlarged uterus. Since Mrs. Watson has a history of urinary retention, it is important to check for distended bladder. Mrs. Watson's bladder is non-palpable and her bimanual examination is unremarkable. It is also important to do a rectovaginal examination to look for anal sphincter defect, rectocele, enterocele, or stool impaction. Mrs. Watson's rectovaginal examination is unremarkable. Some gynecologists may also do a neurologic examination. They may check for bulbo cavernous reflex and any cutaneous reflex or the wink reflex. They may also check for the knee and ankle reflexes. Intact neurological function suggests normal sacral pathways. Mrs. Watson's reflexes are intact. If the patient reports having any pelvic pain or dyspareunia, 
you may also want to check the lower back for any asymmetry. During history and physical examination, it is very important to fight your patient. Five stands for feelings, ideas, function, and expectations. Ask about patient's concerns, ideas of what is going on, whether the symptoms interfere with your daily function, and what you would like to have done for this problem. Having a sense of how prolapse affects the patient's life is very important. While some patients may find that their symptoms do not interfere with their daily activities, others may avoid exercising or sexual activity, while others may find them debilitating. Since Mrs. Watson has had these symptoms for more than five years, it is important to ask what prompted her to seek care now. There's often an event, such as pain, urinary tract infection, urinary retention, worsening of symptoms, or impact on lifestyle that prompts patients to seek care. It is also very important to clarify patients' expectations. Ask about desire for future sexual activity and fertility. If a patient does not desire to be sexually active in the future, obliterative procedures such as Lefort colpoclesis or complete colpoclesis may be considered. Mrs. Watson thinks that the bulge is her bladder, and she has come in to see you because she feels scared of having another episode of urinary retention. She says that she did not know what to do last time this happened until her daughter brought her to the emergency department. You encourage Mrs. Watson to seek medical attention if she experiences urinary retention in the future. She feels like this problem has greatly affected her life. She's avoiding sexual activity and has been avoiding going to book club with her friends. Over the last month, her mood has been lower than usual, but she denies any other symptoms of depression. She does not wish to consider surgery at this time and would like to start with some non-surgical interventions. Before we discuss treatment options, are there any investigations that you would like to order? What are you concerned about? Since Mrs. Watson reports having incomplete bladder emptying and dysuria, it is important to check for post-void residual and do your analysis for a urinary tract infection. Post-void residual can be done with an in and out catheterization, ultrasound, or with a portable bladder scanner. Do not rely on one post-void residual measurement. If the post-void residual is elevated, repeat the measurement. A normal PVR is less than 50 cc's. A PVR less than 100 cc's is not worrisome. Mrs. Watson's post-void residual is 60 cc's, which is not worrisome. Her urinalysis is negative for a urinary tract infection. Her dysuria could be secondary to urogenital atrophy. You can perform urodynamics if the patient has an elevated PVR on initial assessment, if they have failed conservative treatment, or if they're considering surgery. Your dynamics can be done with a pessary in or out to assess bladder function and continence. Even when a patient does not experience stress incontinence symptoms, a pessary or surgery may unmask incontinence. If a patient has stress incontinence and will undergo surgery, she may also need a concurrent anti-incontinence surgery. Mrs. Watson would like to have conservative management and her PVR is not worrisome. Thus, we can admit urodynamics for now. Now that we know what to do on history and physical examination and we know which investigations to order, let's move on to the next video and talk about the treatment plan.